I'm Sandra Smith in for Chris Wallace. Presidents and lawmakers from both parties honor a political giant, Senator John McCain, for his decades of public service. The Senate, the country, the world are lesser places tonight with the loss of John McCain. The war hero, presidential candidate, and six-term senator, dead at 81 after a battle with brain cancer. This hour, we'll talk to some who served alongside him in Congress, former Senators Kelly Ayotte and John Kyle. Plus... Thanks for having me on again, Chris. I love our spirited discussions. Uh, me too, always. We share Senator John McCain's most memorable moments on Fox News Sunday. And... You can't replace a man like that. Everyone looked up to him. Everyone respected him. We'll ask the Sunday panel about the political maverick's legacy in the era of extreme partisanship. Then President Trump, seemingly rattled by the legal downfall of two former close associates, reignites his war with his attorney general and the Justice Department. Even my enemies say that Jeff Sessions should have told you that he was going to recuse himself and then you wouldn't have put him in. Today, we'll discuss the president's feud with the nation's top law enforcement official. He took the job and then he said, I'm going to recuse myself. I said, what kind of a man is this? Plus, the legal and political ramifications from the Fed's conviction of Trump's former campaign chairman and the guilty plea from his former fixer. It's called flipping, and it almost ought to be illegal. With former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez. Then, we'll get reaction from a key defender of the president, his former campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. He's being remembered as an American hero, patriot, and lifelong public servant with unwavering commitment to his country. Senator John McCain, one of the most storied politicians of our time, died Saturday following a year-long battle with brain cancer. Tributes are planned in his home state of Arizona and here in Washington for the statesman who made a name for himself by often rising above party politics, earning the moniker, Maverick of the Senate. Now to Phoenix and Fox News correspondent Alicia Cunha with the very latest on all of this. Alicia, good morning to you. Hi, good morning, Sandra. The man who'd been an American political institution for decades loved his adopted state of Arizona. And it was here in the rural home outside Sedona he so adored that John McCain died. He battled brain cancer for more than a year. On Friday, the family announced the end was near, and within minutes of his passing Saturday, tributes poured in from across the political world. President Trump, who has so often criticized McCain, took to Twitter to express his deepest sympathies to the McCain family, saying, our hearts and prayers are with you. As the flags outside the State House in Phoenix were lowered to half staff, former presidents, colleagues on Capitol Hill, and others praised the 81-year-old war hero, Senate veteran, and 2008 Republican presidential nominee. In a bipartisan sign of respect and appreciation, Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer says he wants Congress to rename its Russell Senate office building for McCain. He was always willing to speak truth to power at a time when there are so few people who do that. He will be so missed. McCain's death came nine years to the day of another Senate legend, Ted Kennedy. McCain delivered a eulogy at the Kennedy funeral, and while the friends were sometimes legislative combatants, they also partnered together in attempts to change the nation's immigration system. They each died of the same form of brain cancer, glioblastoma. Perhaps the most moving tributes were offered not by politicians, rather by McCain's wife and daughter. Cindy McCain writing on Twitter, My heart is broken. I am so lucky to have lived the adventure of loving this incredible man for 38 years. He passed the way he lived, on his own terms, surrounded by the people he loved in the place he loved best. Daughter Megan said, He loved me and I loved him. He taught me how to live. His love and his care, ever present, always unfailing, took me from a girl to a woman and showed me what it is to be a man. Earlier this year, McCain published what would turn out to be his last book. In it, he voiced satisfaction for always living his life in the moment, perhaps imperfectly at times, but always with passion. Some things didn't work out the way I hoped they would. I had difficult moments and a few disappointments, but by God, I enjoyed it. 
And we soon expect to hear official details on memorial services in the days ahead, both here in Phoenix as well as Washington, D.C. We do know that the senator will be buried at the Naval Academy Cemetery in Annapolis, Maryland. Also to come, a decision on replacing the legend. That responsibility belongs to Governor Doug Ducey, a Republican. Sandra. Alicia Acuna reporting live from Phoenix. Alicia, thank you. Joining me now from Manchester, former U.S. Senator Kelly Ayotte, who was dubbed one of the three amigos on Capitol Hill, along with Senators McCain and Graham, for their joint pushes on foreign policy. Senator Ayotte, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Good to have you on the program this morning. You wrote a beautiful... Thank you, Sandra. You wrote a beautiful tribute, Senator, calling Senator McCain a, a dear friend and a mentor. How will you remember him? Uh, I remember him, uh, first of all, what a tremendous loss for his family, but for the entire nation. I remember John for his courage, his tenacity, and his wonderful sense of humor. I mean, he was tough as nails, uh, incredibly bright, and then also just always cracking a joke, always a smile, believed so strongly in America, and really a patriot, but always never took himself too seriously. What an amazing man, and I feel so grateful to have known him. And he loved New Hampshire. He won the first in the nation primary there twice. He loved to campaign there. Why did he, why did he, enjoy, uh, why did he enjoy New Hampshire so much? As you mentioned in your tribute, he loved his time spent there. John had a very special connection with New Hampshire. Uh, I think we consider him an honorary Granite Stater. I mean, he came back twice here to win the New Hampshire primary, and he did it from voter to voter. He did town halls here. I mean, hundreds of town halls here in New Hampshire. And so he, he forged a special connection with the people of New Hampshire. He has so many friends here. He's thought of so fondly here. And really, his straight talk and the way he would just answer anyone's questions, speak his mind, and be so direct. and, and I think also a very special connection with our military families and our veterans here who he cared mm -hmm. so deeply about. Senator, you, you just mentioned how he was, he used that straight talk, he spoke his mind, and he's credited for rising above party politics. How was he able to do that? He, he just had the courage of his convictions, and um, he really was a true bipartisan champion someone who was focused on getting things done for the American people, and, and he had that political courage. Uh, even when his own party disagreed with him, he was willing to get out there because he knew that we need to solve problems. He wanted to make our nation better. And, you know, that, that takes a lot of courage, and he just had so much moral fortitude. You know, I, I had the privilege of seeing him at the ranch this spring, and what he said to me was, do the right thing, Kelly. I mean, that's how he lived his life, and I, I'll never forget it. What does the political landscape look like in McCain's absence? Well, I think that, you know, as we look at someone like John McCain and his passing, I mean, his legacy is really one of civility and dignity and honor and integrity and, and something that we really need very much in politics and bipartisanship. You were a big part of the confirmation process for Neil Gorsuch, and now we've got Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation coming up next week. If I could, Senator, ask you what your expectations are for that, and timing of a replacement for McCain's seat is going to be crucial as well. It is, um, and you know, I think that this is an excellent nomination by the president. And I would expect that he will be confirmed before the elections. Um, you know, tremendously qualified, both in his education and experience. And just like Justice Gorsuch, uh, I think he'll have a strong vote, and I think it'll be a bipartisan vote. Senator Ayotte, uh, so sorry for your loss. He was a friend, a mentor to you, and it's nice to hear your he stories was. this morning. And thank you. Thank you for coming on and telling them. Thank you for having me on, Sandra. My heart goes out to Cindy and, his, and John's family. What a wonderful group of people. Thank you, Senator. Joining us now, former GOP Minority Whip John Kyle, who was McCain's colleague from Arizona in the U.S. Senate. From 1995 to 2013, he's also been discussed as a possible replacement 
for McCain. Senator Kyle, thank you for coming on the program this morning. Good morning, Senator. You join us by phone, Senator. If you could just share with us your thoughts this morning. Senator McCain was a, a, a man you worked closely with for, for many, many years. Well, that's right. Um, the uh, lead in to your uh, uh, comments uh, or to your interview with Senator Ayotte uh, included the comment, living life in the moment. Uh, John's entire approach to life was we want to get the most out of the time that we have here, so let's dig in and get going. And in his case, it pointed him toward public service, service uh, of his country and of the state of Arizona. And he certainly did get the most out of the time that he had here. He was a busy guy and got a lot done in his life. Uh, what was it like being in the political arena with John McCain? Well, there was never a dull moment, I'll put it that way. Uh, John was involved in so many different things. It was a great experience. We, we uh, uh, worked together on some things, and then on others we divided responsibilities to make sure that our, our state was well served. Uh, but uh, just all of the experiences of uh, working with John, there, there was never a dull moment. And I want to just peg on to one thing that Kelly Ayotte talked about, uh, because your, your viewers should know what a mentor that John was to a lot of the newer members of Congress. He led probably more congressional delegation trips abroad than, than anyone else in the Congress. And he always included the uh, newer members to help them meet the same people that he knew abroad to visit the same places. And by the way, these were not garden spots. We're talking Yemen and Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that. Uh, but he did that uh, not only to teach the newer members, but also to represent the United States in a very effective way abroad. How specifically, Senator, did he want to inspire the, the next generation? Well, I think he wanted to do two things. First, uh, by his example, the way that he conducted himself to show that that was uh, the most effective way and the proper way to uh, represent the United States. And then secondly, of course, to dig into the issues in all of these different places. I firmly believe that he uh, was uh, a, that, that his legacy will be his commitment to and, and his contributions to the national security of the, of the United States. Uh, that's where I think he made the most difference, and I'm sure there are people all over the world today mm -hmm. that are joining in the morning of John McCain's death. In an era of extreme partisanship, Senator, what will or what does the political environment look like without him? Well, it's not as good because uh, John was always there as kind of a, a conscious of, of the Senate. I remember one day going on to the floor, and he was just uh, incensed that whoever the Republican leader was at the time, and this was a long time ago, it probably was his great good friend Bob Dole, but somehow or other they weren't giving the Democrats a vote on an amendment that they wanted. And he was in sense, he said, we have to give them a vote, it's the right thing to do. So he was always there trying to make sure that both sides got their say and were treated fairly. And uh, as has already been noted, he didn't have any trouble working across the aisle. Senator Kyle, your name uh, has been whispered as a possible replacement for now that vacant seat. Uh, the Arizona Republican governor is tasked with, with naming that replacement. He has now said he will not do so until Senator McCain is laid to rest. What do you want to see happen with, with McCain's seat? Governor Ducey has an awesome responsibility there, and um, I, I think the, the key thing is to try to continue the representation of the state of Arizona, but more than that, as I alluded to earlier, to uh, continue representation for all the people of the United States on the most critical international issues. Mm. John had the experience to do that, and he had the, the instincts, in my view, to make the right kind of decisions, and I hope whoever the governor appoints can uh, work in that vein. And Senator Kyle, I know you'll be heading to Washington soon for the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, you will be the Sherpa rallying support around those confirmation, uh, his confirmation. And uh, Senator Kyle, we really appreciate your time and thank you for coming on the program this morning and looking back at a man you worked very closely with for a long period of time there in the Senate. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, when we come back, our Sunday panel joins us to discuss the legacy of John McCain. And we will take a look at some of his key appearances right here on Fox News Sunday next.
As far as Sunday shows go, Senator John McCain was a perennial guest, whether as his party's presidential nominee, an authority on foreign policy, or a provocateur of the White House. You could count on him to make news, including right here with Chris Wallace on Fox News Sunday. Senator, you probably didn't make a lot of friends at the White House this week when you contradicted uh, one of their main attack points against Senator Kerry, which is to say that he is weak on defense. John Kerry is a friend of mine. Uh, I don't uh, choose to attack or disparage uh, him, and I will not. I know that having a friend in Washington uh, from another party is not acceptable to some in Washington. I have two words for them, too bad. I have found in my life that when I do what I think is right, for example, on the marriage amendment, uh, it always turns out in the end okay. When I do things for political expediency, which I have from time to time, it's always turned out poorly. Give me an example since you bring it up. What have you done? What would you admit you did for political expediency? I went down to South Carolina and said that the flag that was flying over the state capitol, which was a Confederate flag, was that I shouldn't be involved in it. It was a state issue. It's an act of cowardice. Act of cowardice on your part? Yes. And you did it because you thought this will help me in the South Carolina yeah. primary in 2000? Yeah, sure. This, this won't alienate certain voting block. And, and, and I lost anyway. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I was surprised to learn about both of you is that you are, and maybe I'm wrong about this too, superstitious. Uh, I'm told that you have lucky suits. I'm told, Senator, you have a lucky rock. <laughs> oh but after everything you've been through, Senator, you've also been quoted as saying that you feel you're one of the luckiest people on earth and that you feel a certain, not to get highfalutin about it, a sense of destiny. Do you feel that you have one final mission to serve this country? I've been blessed to be able to serve for many, many years, both in the military and in public office. It's one of the great honors of my life, but it doesn't mean that I was meant to be president. It just means that whatever time I have left, I would be of service to the country. And I uh, am grateful, gra incredibly grateful that I've had the opportunity. And if it stops tomorrow, I will look back at an imperfect person, but one who always tried to serve. Republican insiders, senators say that your big job going forward is to reach out to conservatives. Here's what one McCain insider said the other day. So can he then go on and become the nominee of this party? Yes, I think Holder and Nose are going to have to take him. <laughs> oh boy, Senator. Is, is your, one, is your mother right? And two, how do you persuade conservatives to stop holding their nose? I, I love my mother dearly, more than anything in the world, uh, but uh, really my mom is not, is not a complete expert uh, on this issue, and I love her, and I love her candor, and she's, uh, she's been a great, great asset, particularly whenever the age issue uh, comes up. On McCain's desk is a picture of his granddad during World War II. In the corner, you can see a photo of the senator as a little boy. McCain says, treasure your children. If I had a message, because I'm not as young as I used to be, is enjoy every moment with them. Enjoy every second, because they all grow so fast, and you'll have some of your best memories of the time you spent with them. I fought against my own administration when I wanted to, when I thought it was necessary to do so, and I will fight against this administration when I think it's necessary to do so. But, but if, I'm, yeah. if I may press sure. it, uh, it isn't what other people are saying about you, yeah. it's what you're saying sure. about yourself. Yeah. You said, I never considered myself a maverick. Well, all I've, what I was saying was that I have considered myself a person who's a fighter. I wouldn't be around today if I wasn't a fighter. I fight for the things that I believe in, and sometimes that's called a maverick, sometimes that's called a partisan. And people can draw their own conclusions. I prefer great American myself. As the son and the grandson of military men and as a war hero yourself. And a you, son, and a son in the Navy. Yes. And a son in the Navy. One who was in the Marines too. Uh, great, your, your thoughts on Memorial Day? Oh, the great honor of my life. Uh, it was to have had the opportunity long ago and far away to have served in the company of heroes. 
I'm the luckiest guy you have ever interviewed and will ever interview. I'm the most fortunate man on earth, and I thank God for it every single day. Thanks for having me on again, Chris. I love our spirited discussions. Uh, me too, always. It is time now for our Sunday group. Former Press Secretary for Vice President Pence, Mark Lauder. Columnist for The Hill, Juan Williams. The co-host of Benson and Harf on Fox News Radio, Marie Harf, and Fox News correspondent, Jillian Turner. At least he left us laughing there and in such a sad few hours um, that we have seen since the family announced his death yesterday, Mark. He did make us laugh. He absolutely did. And the only thing I can say is if he would have decided to retire and enjoy a quiet, peaceful life after his military service, no one could have faulted him for what he went through. But that he did there. not do. But he felt called to serve and do more, and he did. And he did. Even in those final 18 months or so of his life, he kept fighting the brain cancer for sure, but he still stayed politically involved as well, Marie. Absolutely. He was not going to just walk away and not have a voice in so many important issues we continue to debate, whether it's health care, whether it's the state of our politics. And Sandra, I've thought a lot over the last few weeks about, you know, John McCain was a hawk, for sure. But for me, one of the most significant things he did was when he worked to make peace with Vietnam, a country where he was tortured, where he fought a war. He banded together with John Kerry, he, who he disagreed with on many things, including the Vietnam War, and said that our past does not have to dictate our future when it comes to our relationships around the world, normalized relations with the country who tortured him. Mm -hmm. That is an extraordinary statement. And uh, you know, uh, all of us sitting at this table at some point in our careers, we've, we've had the opportunity and the honor of knowing Senator John McCain and getting to know him in some instances. Juan, we've got a picture of you and your son <laughs> with, with Senator okay, McCain. Yeah. He's someone you knew. So really that's the well. last time I saw Senator McCain. We, were at, uh, we ran to him at the Nationals baseball game this summer. So that's the last time I mm -hmm. think that he was here. Uh, and again, you know, Senator McCain and I had had disagreements. My job is to sometimes be critical of politicians. And I remember when he was running, I think it was in 07, he was down at the bottom in terms of uh, candidates seeking the Republican nomination. I said, it looks like John McCain is out of gas here. And boy, he didn't like it. He let me know he did not, he didn't think that was the right thing for me to say. And then when he came back, he let me know, hey, I'm back. I won, and you should tell people that I came back, you know. So that's John McCain. But to me, just picking up on what Marie said, what stuns me is not only that he would go back and work to normalize relations with Vietnam, but here in America, at a time of political polarization, part of the reason I think we honor McCain so much today, it comes out of our living need to say that we can go beyond party politics, we can go beyond polarization, uh, we can go beyond race. Uh, you heard what he said to Chris about acknowledging the mistake on the Confederate flag issue. But if you think about his working with Russ Feingold on campaign finance reform, with Ted Kennedy on health care, uh, you think about him standing up to his own party on uh, the Affordable Care Act recently and saying, you know what, I don't think we can just strip it. We have to have something to put in its place. This is the maverick. He said he didn't like to be called a maverick. <laughs> He'd rather be called a great American. I think on this Sunday morning, Sandra, we can say, John McCain, you, are, you were not only a patriot, a great American, and an American hero. You know, he referenced back, Jillian, to his mother, Roberta uh, McCain. She's still with us. She's 106 years old. Uh, he was certainly, obviously, a war hero, uh, a, a politician with a long, a, a long career, a successful career in politics. But he talked about his family being the most important thing in the world to him. Oh, of course. And those of us who know and had the chance to work with Megan when she was here at the channel know just how tight his bond was, not with her, but with all of his children. Marie pointed out that a really important part of his legacy is that he was uh, a, a national security hawk, a defense hawk. But I think it's always important to point out that he was not a warmonger. Um, far from it. You know, he spent a lot of time advocating for better support and services for service members, veterans, and their families. But he had a very healthy appreciation, especially later on uh, during his tenure in the Senate, for the limits to the use of military force. I always think about Afghanistan. He lobbied President Obama really hard for increased troop presence in Afghanistan and then was the first guy on the Senate floor after that was secured to stand up and say, look, America's never going to secure all of its interests in this, in this country with the use of military force alone. He's very unique mm -hmm. in that. He's, he's worked on both sides of the issue as a service member and then in policy. There's no one else like that. 
and, and not a lot of questions about what will happen with that vacant seat, uh, who will fill it, and what kind of, the, the timing is going to be so important, obviously, with the Brett Kavanaugh hearings coming up. Uh, a fighter, he called himself, and I think we all agree we saw him the same way. We have to take a break there with our panel, but when we come back, two of the president's former close associates are facing jail time. What does this turn of events mean for the president? We will speak with two insiders, former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez and former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski, next. Tensions between President Trump, his attorney general, and the Justice Department reaching epic levels after a week of legal bombshells involving once loyal members of his inner circle. Let's review. This week, Mr. Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, convicted in federal court on financial crimes. His former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, implicated the president in a hush money scheme. And the two men closest to those payments granted immunity. The White House says none of this has anything to do with the president, that he did nothing wrong and there are no charges against him. Joining us now, Alberto Gonzalez, former U.S. Attorney General who served under President George W. Bush. Welcome back to Fox News Sunday, sir. Thank you for coming on the program. Good morning. If I can, let me, let me just say as an, as an Air Force veteran, uh, I honor John McCain's service and sacrifice mm -hmm. on behalf of our country, uh, our military, our veterans and their families. We appreciate your words this morning as we're all sharing sentiments in the wake of John McCain's death. Uh, we're following the developments of what was, it was a hectic week for this White House and for the president and questions about what sort of legal peril the president is in or is he in any legal peril at all? Depends on who you ask. I want to start first with the president's argument that his attorney general never c took control of the department. I put an attorney general that never took control of the Justice Department, Jeff Sessions, never took control of the Justice Department. And uh, it's a sort of an incredible thing. So first, just let's establish where you stand on this, Judge. Is that criticism of the president, of his AG, is that fair? That is a very serious allegation that the Department of Justice is out of control. You know, Jeff Sessions has been mainly quiet until now in the face of a lot of criticism from the White House. Uh, and, and he finally responded. And I, and I think it was appropriate that he did respond because to say that the department is out of control is a very serious charge. From my perspective, from my vantage point, you know, there appears to be investigations ongoing, appears to be successful prosecutions. And so I, I think that it's important for the attorney general to reassure the American people and speaking to the president that he is in control of the Department of Justice and that it's operating the way that it should be operated. Now, it's not to say that the president, as president of the United States, he has has the right to be critical, uh, to say what he wants to say about his cabinet officials. As a general matter, I think it's more effective to do it privately than mm -hmm. publicly because it, it undermines the, depart the attorney general and also, I think, hurts the morale of the Department of Justice. So I think it's preferable for the president to, to speak his concerns and criticism to the attorney general directly as opposed to publicly, but he certainly has a right to speak out. Well, Sessions hit back at the president and sort of rare for him. He doesn't normally publicly uh, hit back at the president president, but here he writes, the action of the Department of Justice will not be improperly influenced by political considerations. And like I said, this marks one of the few times that we've seen him publicly respond to the president, although he did not call him out by name there. But what is, Judge, the danger in this feud between the president and his AG? What is the danger in this con continuing? Well, as I, as I said, I think, uh, I fear that because the president is head of the executive branch and can remove the attorney general any time that he wants, that the continuous criticism without taking any action, I fear makes the president look a little weak. But I also worry about the fact, as I said, it undercuts the attorney general's authority in agency battles with other cabinet secretaries, with his counterparts around the world. And I do think it has a long-term effect upon the morale of the Department of Justice and undermines the integrity, uh, how people view the Department of Justice, how the American people view the, the institution. And I think that's, that's very, very dangerous. And so, as I said, the president has a right to speak out, no question about that. He 
just unhappy with the performance of the Attorney General. But as a general matter, I'm not sure that it's doing the president much good. It may be preferable, more effective to do it privately. Meanwhile, a lot of developments uh, as far as the Robert Mueller investigation goes this week, a conviction in the case of Paul Manafort and the White House making it very clear where it stands on that case. The Manafort case doesn't have anything to do with the president, doesn't have anything to do with his campaign, and it doesn't have anything to do with the White House. What are the ramifications of Paul Manafort's conviction, Judge? I think it's still too early to tell. It is interesting. The, the White House is correct that no charges have been brought against the president, but we need to be mindful of the fact that it is current DOJ policy, as, as I understand it, that the president cannot be indicted and the president cannot be prosecuted. So you're not going to see any charges, I don't believe, brought against the president, irrespective of whether or not there's a conclusion by the Department of Justice that the president engaged in criminal wrongdoing. But nonetheless, I think with respect to, to the uh, to the uh, in, uh, conviction of Paul Manafort and the guilty plea of, of Michael Cohen, uh, you know, it's 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 not good. It's it creates a lot of debate and swirl around the president as an individual, and that's never good. I think it, it diverts the president's attention from the business of the American people, the very serious issues, both domestically and and across the world, that deserve the president's full attention, and that's what I worry about. But the president did seem to sort of praise Paul Manafort in the wake of. Con his conviction, leaving questions about whether or not he may pardon him. How, look how he responded to that question. Paul Manafort's a good man. He was with Ronald Reagan. He was with uh, a lot of different people over the years, and I feel very sad about that. So that was him on the ground in West Virginia, seemingly praising Paul Manafort. Uh, when asked specifically in a Fox News interview whether or not he would pardon him, he did not say no and he did not say yes. Do, is he laying the groundwork for a pardon? Well, you'll have to. We'll have to ask the president. I don't. I can't. I don't, can't get into his mind. It is a bit unusual for the president of the United States, head of the executive branch in the Department of Justice, works for for the president of the United States, and they've had a they had a very successful conviction of Paul Manafort, and have the president then, uh, uh, you know, speak so well of of Paul Manafort was a, was somewhat unusual in terms of a pardon. As we know, the president's pardon power is virtually unlimited, and so mm -hmm. the president may decide that this is a particular case where a pardon is. Warranted if he believes that Paul Manafort was was unfairly treated, but again, that that would send a message that he believes his Department of Justice acted in a way that was that was unprofessional and unfair. And I, you know, I worry about that kind of message as well. So many wondering how far this Mueller investigation will go, how long it will go on. Uh, the president talking about a sit-down interview with Mueller, a perjury trap. You heard that from Rudy Giuliani. Ultimately, do you think the president should sit down with Robert Mueller? I think it might be helpful politically for the president to at least respond to written questions. I, I don't know about sitting down with uh, and, and, and giving oral testimony to, to uh, Robert Mueller, but I, I think perhaps it may it may uh, ease in the minds of certain members of the American public uh, the president's involvement, his, the president's knowledge about Russia. In, uh, in, uh, Russia involvement in, in the mm -hmm. presidential election 2016. So, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, that's a big wait and see. We'll see where it all goes. Uh, Judge Alberto Gonzalez, great to get your take on things this morning. Thank you for thank you for joining us on Fox News Sunday.